Super Nima. How's it going? Oh, good. How's it going? Good, good. Awesome. Um, just hold on a second. I'm going to grab a cup of coffee. Ooh. What? What's the matter? Well, it looks like it's been sitting there a while. Do you think it's really fresh? Yeah, I guess you're right. Mm. What about this thing? Maybe I can make a cup of coffee on, on this thing. Mm. It says, it's got a lot of labels on it. Looks complicated. Burn. Do not open. How am I supposed to use this thing? Uh, you know, I suspect that you only need that many labels when it's routinely screwed up. All right. I'm going to go with high odds of failure. Yeah, OK. Well, what, what should I do? I mean, like, I really need a cup of coffee. Um, well, uh, how about a French press? That's pretty foolproof. But how do you use this thing? You just dump the grounds in, hot water, stir it up, and then uh, then you got to wait about 10 minutes. You don't have that kind of time. We have to shoot soon. You're right, you're right. Um, what other what other options have we got? What's what's this thing? Ooh, AeroPress, yeah. great choice. Okay. It's actually um, really easy to use. Yeah. You get very fresh coffee flavor and um, an immediate gratification. It's super fast. Awesome, well then let me do it. Uh, just one deal killer though. What? It only makes enough coffee for one. Aren't you gonna share? Welcome to the second episode of Femgineer TV brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar, and the founder of Femgineer. For those of you who aren't familiar, Femgineer is an education company, and our goal is to help innovators build software products to give them more freedom in their careers, to enrich other people's lives, and to make the tech community a lot more inclusive. When it comes to building software, we're fundamentally just solving problems, and there's always more than one approach to solving a problem. But too often we have a lot of constraints, like time, money, and talent. And when we're dealing with all those constraints, we want to make sure that we're taking the right approach. So in today's episode, we're going to be talking about how to make smart trade-offs when it comes to developing software products. And to help us out, I've invited Jocelyn Goldfein, the former director of engineering at Facebook, to talk to us about how to make these trade-offs. Jocelyn has helped companies from early stage startups all the way to growth stage startups and enterprise companies build software products and manage engineering teams. So she's had quite a lot on her plate and has been able to help these companies m meet their business goals and ship products on time. So thank you, Jocelyn, for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to have you on the show and to be talking about trade-offs. Um, and you know, we met a few years ago at a dinner, mm -hmm. and you were just getting started at Facebook. Mm -hmm. So it's wonderful to see that after all these years, you've made such a positive impact on the company. And I also want to thank you for all your encouragement in helping young women pursue degrees in computer science and careers in engineering. Thanks. So, yeah, thank it's you so much. It's definitely a cause that I care about a lot. Awesome. Now, before we dig into today's topic, mm -hmm. I want to take a couple steps back and just ask you, what got you interested in building software, and what led you to then join Facebook? Um, sure, I, you know, was um, I, I didn't actually start out knowing that I was going to be interested in computer science. I was a nerd in high school, but I was a really well-rounded one, and uh, I just got to, got to college and I took a computer science class fall quarter of my freshman year, and I thought, wow, this is really fun, and I'm actually pretty good at it. Like, and I just sort of. Uh, went from there, but even by the time I graduated, I had no conviction about what I wanted to be when I grew up, and so I just kind of thought, well, I better get a job as a software engineer and find out. And I had a chance to work for a lot of really interesting companies, including my own startup, and I was at VMware for, uh, I joined when it was a pretty small, medium small company of just a couple hundred people, um, and I grew up from, you know, an engineer and engineering manager. Um, I stayed seven years. The company wow. was 10,000 people when I left, nice. um, and I was a vice president of engineering at, by the end, and so um, really grew up at that company, and then wanted to keep growing and keep learning new things, and so it just seemed like a obvious choice to me to walk away from everything I knew about <laughs> making enterprise software and operating systems and, uh, and go work for a consumer web app. And so I joined Facebook um, about four years ago and, um, and had an absolutely great time. Yeah. So now, given your extensive background, mm -hmm. both at early stage to growth stage startups and building enterprise products, you've had to deal with a lot of trade-offs. And in a very recent talk mm -hmm. that you gave, I remember you talking about this thing called the trade-off space. 
So let's start by digging into what, what exactly is the trade-off space? Sure. Like, maybe you've worked with an engineering manager who's said, you know, oh, features, quality, schedule, pick two. You get kind of a bad rap for saying things like that. I'm guilty of saying things like that. Sure. But it's actually a lot more complicated than that. You, it, f first of all, I mean, it's not yes or no. You're going to have some features, and you're going to have some quality, and you're going to have some schedule. But there's also a lot of other things we care about, too. We want our product to be beautiful and easy to use, and we want it to be speedy and responsive and we want it to be reliable and never have downtime and um, and we want it to have exactly the features that are going to make customers buy it and you know I, I could go on and on and like all those things are good things but the one thing that is finite is you know time and energy right and so no matter what you do no matter what release process you follow no matter what culture you have like there's no silver bullet you can't have everything all the time and so w getting some of each of the things we care about is a choice and one I think one I believe that we should make consciously and mm -hmm. so how much of each of those things you do is what I call the trade-off space got it now when we look at this space you know you've, you've listed probably like 10 things yeah, that we right. think about <laughs> right it's 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 really easy to get overwhelmed yeah. by it whether we're a manager or whether we're the individual contributor how can we alleviate some of those feelings? How can we maybe reduce the problem space a little bit so that we can ship product and, and meet our goals? Yeah. Well, one interesting side effect for me of working at such different companies and on such different kinds of products was I found that different environments, different technology stacks really lend themselves to different solutions. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I think this will be pretty familiar to most engineers. The technology stack you're using really makes some things easy and some things hard. You know, if you're on the web, at the top of the stack, if you will, you get a lot of reuse. You get to sort of um, build a lot of functionality very quickly because you're relying on frameworks that other people have built. You get to deploy your code on your own servers so you don't have to worry about testing it in a wide environment. And, you know, if you want to make a change, you just update your own hardware because you have control of, of updates. Um, you start working your way down the stack to middleware, to native mobile and desktop apps, even to, you know, operating systems or God help you hardware. And um, it gets you get more and more control as you move down. The reason a lot of people make native apps for phones is because on the phone you can send push notifications, you can get access to the camera with a native app. You can't do that with a web app. Um, but you also give something up when you go down the stack. Um, you might be able to, um, you, you won't get as much reuse and you, as soon as you deal with installing software on somebody else's device, mm -hmm. you're going through a third party to certify your application or you're sending a CD to someone that they have to install. Yeah. Um, now you have a lot less control over your update cycle. And, um, and so you have to think really differently about how frequently you can update. Yeah, I know for myself when I was getting started, um, my first job was actually designing uh, electronic design automation software. Mm -hmm. So it was software for chip designers uh, like Intel and AMD. Mm -hmm. And you know this was probably millions and millions of lines of code and was definitely a native app. Mm -hmm. And the sort of technology trade-offs that we had to make were very different from my second company, which was mint.com, right? Mm -hmm. Consumer internet app, web applications. So we mm -hmm. had different ways of thinking given our two technology stacks. So it became very, very apparent that you know difference of you know, enterprise versus uh, consumer and most importantly like where you are in terms of the stack yeah um, and I definitely think you know Facebook's well known for the phrase move fast and break things and I think that makes total sense when if you break something you can update the software on your own web server um, it's not quite that simple if you're shipping an operating system to somebody's data center that may get updated months or years later yeah so I know that you know as engineers, it's really easy for us to think about the technology stack and develop an intuition and be able to make trade-offs and, and decisions quickly. But a lot of times we aren't aware of the business model we're operating under, yeah. and you know we either get really frustrated with the way management's making decisions, or we don't have an understanding. What are some ways in which, as engineers or technical folks, we can develop that intuition or some understanding so that when we do have to make trade-offs, we keep that in mind? Yeah, I mean, I think there's sort of two sides to any decision you're making about investing your time and effort in 
in doing something, whether it's a performance speed up or a test suite or, you know, and it's what does it cost me and how am I going to benefit? Like, does the, and do the benefits outweigh the costs, right? It's kind of simple. Yeah. And, and I think the technology stack tells us a lot about what things cost. And I think you're right. Engineers have great intuition for what things cost. But I think to make good decisions, you've got to not just understand the cost, you've also got to understand the benefits. And I think mostly those are driven by your business model. So if you're building a product for enterprises that are spending a lot of money on your software and rely on it every day to do their jobs, then reliability is really important to them. Mm -hmm. And that's really important to your company having a good reputation and meeting your users' needs. You know, at um, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, if you're doing a consumer app, maybe a, a free app, um, you know, people's expectations are a lot lower when they aren't paying you a lot yeah. of money for something. But because it's not a need to use, it's a want to use, actually the UX, the, the sort of delight and enjoyment of using your app needs to be much, much higher for people to sort of opt into wanting to use it. And so, I you know, I think that's one reason why even though consumer apps are free or very inexpensive compared to enterprise software, they're generally much more beautiful and much mm -hmm. more fun to use. Uh, although we have a new breed of startups that are sort of challenging that received wisdom and seeing what happens when we take consumer uh, design philosophy and bring it to enterprise software. And is that able to make a real compelling difference? And I think it will if we find that it's able to meet employee needs better and able to achieve business goals better. Um, but knowing if that's a good trade-off or not, to spend a lot of time on the mm -hmm. design of your enterprise software means understanding if that's what matters most to your users. Yeah, so that's a kind of new novel experiment people are doing, huh? Where they're actually bringing some of that rich UI back to the enterprise. enterprise. That's interesting. <laughs> it's really interesting because, like I said, when I was working um, at the, you know, building EDA software, uh, it certainly was not by any means beautiful. Like, yes. not even the code base was beautiful. Yes. But it worked really well. And mm -hmm. like you said, very, very reliable because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, this is going to go and design 90, 40 nanometer technology. So it needs to be precise, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many things downstream that uh, are impacted by it. Yeah. But didn't have a beautiful user experience mm -hmm. and was still functional and you know made millions of dollars for the company or actually billions of dollars yeah. um, and then contrast that to mint which was consumer internet mm -hmm. and you know free application had a very very beautiful user experience um, and, and you know user interface so there was obviously a difference here and part of that difference also came down to the customer and what their needs were yeah. Right. So can you elaborate a little bit more on like how can we take back some of the customer needs and apply mm -hmm. that to our the way that we think about trade offs as we're building? Yeah. I mean, I think that in some ways to an engineer, it's counterintuitive that the web app has the more beautiful UI than the native app. If you think about it, the further down the stack you go, the more control you have over pixels. I mean, if you want to create the richest, most immersive user experiences, like you try to bypass the operating system even, and that's where we see video games or, you know, in, in this day and age, I'm really excited about what Oculus is, uh, yeah. Rift is doing. And to, to deliver like those incredible user experiences, you actually have to go very low in the stack. Um, but at the same time, it's not a technology-driven choice alone. Even though your EDA app was native software, it was lower in the stack, it had the, the, the capability to deliver a more beautiful UI than an off-the-shelf kind of web app. Nonetheless, um, that wasn't what mattered to your customers. What mattered right. to your customers was that you know, hardware design actually had to go very low in the stack. Um, but at the same time, it's not a technology-driven choice alone. Even though your EDA app was native software, it was lower in the stack, it had the the, the capability to deliver a more beautiful UI than an off-the-shelf kind of web app. Nonetheless, um, that wasn't what mattered to your customers. What right. mattered to your customers was that you know, hardware designers made a design that got to manufacturing and, you know, and produced actual workable components they could sell to their customers. And if the EDA software did not produce, yeah. <laughs> you know, they created tremendous manufacturing waste, then they were out of business. And totally. in that case, your EDA software would also be out of business. Um, whereas with Mint, you know, if people if it's free, if it's not a must-have, then um, then people have to find it easy to use, or they just won't use right. it. Right. They want it to be beautiful yes. when they when they log into their account and see their money or, or don't see their money. But yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's true. And so I think they're um, and and so I think a lot of times we imagine that it's just about you know philosophy or personality or you know this set of founders care about design and that set of founders don't. But I really think you know. 
at the end of the day, as engineers and product people, we have to be motivated by the person using our software. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that we cannot do everything in the world that we'd like to do, so we should focus our efforts on the things that matter most to that person. And I think that when we design for the person, we do our best work. Nice. So we've talked about trade-offs in the context of the technology stack, as well as business model, and now taking into consideration customers. But one, I think, real concern that people have is the cost of a mistake, right? You make a mistake, you could be out of business, or the product gets end of life, and so you've got to have a real appetite for risk. Yeah. And I know, having worked at you know, various companies and, and startups as well, mm-hmm. you've probably come across this appetite for risk. How should people be thinking about that and, and relating it back to the cost of a mistake? Yeah. You know, we talk about risk and failure all the time in the valley. It's like, oh, in order to, you know, in order to innovate, you've got to be willing to fail. And, you know, and, and I, I'm guilty of that too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I really, I do think that you've got to be willing to take risks to do something great. But it's sort of easy, again, to think of appetite for risk as like a character trait or a, a moral quality. And, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's got more of it. So Facebook's, you know, able to innovate. And, you know, maybe the, the CEO of, you know, big enter- of, of, of VMware is very cautious or conservative. And again, I don't think it's a personality trait. If you think about, you know, what is the cost of a mistake, um, I, I think it comes in two parts. One is like, what does it cost you? If you make a mistake, what does it cost you to fix it? Mm-hmm. And let's assume you're a going concern now. Like you've got software, you're established, but, but so you're going to have a chance to fix it. The cost of the mistake isn't you're out of business. Right. Um, so there's what does it take to fix it? Um, and that's, you know, that's like some cost we can reason about. Like, there's a bug that makes it to production. We debug it. We code up a solution. We test our solution. We deploy the solution, right? Like, you know, whatever that cost is, let's call it X, mm-hmm. okay? And then there's another dimension to the cost, which is not what's my cost to my business, but like, what's the pain to my customer, yeah. to my user of my outage? And that's some pain because my software is not working the way they expect it to. And so I think that... Um, if you look at, again, these two dimensions of technology stack and business model, um, if, you, if, your, if your code runs on hardware you control, then that cost to fix X is, you know, whatever X is. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as you introduce, as soon as you start going down the stack, as soon as you have to run on multiple other kinds of hardware, all of a sudden you have to have a test matrix. Right. All of a sudden you have to get Apple to approve your App Store update. All of a sudden you have to get users to be willing to deploy your software, maybe just on their phone with an over-the-air update, or maybe like, you know, maybe it's a hardware OEM that needs to like get a CD to their factory and like re-image a bunch of components as they come off the assembly line, okay? And so I want to say is like as you move down the stack and you go from the code running on your servers to depending on other people, like the cost of fixing it goes up by an order of magnitude. Let's just say 10x. We're making broad sure. ballpark sweeping assumptions. And then let's look at the pain to your users on the business model access. You know, we can joke about Twitter's fail well, but the truth is if like Twitter, if Twitter has a little outage, like we can come back later. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. And, um, and so that pain is, you know, X, but, but as you sort of move down to software that people are relying on, like email, they can't communicate without it or like my revenue booking software, I, my, I can't book sales, I can't operate my manufacturing plant while your software is down, you know, that cost, I would say, also goes up by an order of magnitude. The more people have spent on your software, the more they're relying on it to do their job. Mm-hmm. And then I think if you kind of combine the two axes and you're building, you know, and you're in VMware situation oh, and totally. you are building system software <laughs> that people have paid a lot of money for, you know, I'd love to say it's 10x plus 10x, but it's actually, um, but it's actually geometric expansion, right? It's 10x times 10x, so it's two orders of magnitude more cost. It's 100 times more, and so I think it is perfectly reasonable for free consumer web software to to make a lot of mistakes and quickly fix them, and to choose even a path to designing a product, which is to rapidly experiment. Um, whereas I think at the other end of the spectrum, if you are down, you know, in the in this other sort of quadrant where the cost of a mistake is two orders of magnitude higher, um, then it makes sense to have a much much more careful process mm-hmm. where you are really sure you have something exactly right before you let it out the door. Yeah. So there's a lot going on here, right? There's mm-hmm. a number of ripple effects. There's the fact that your process also needs to be bulletproof or somewhat bulletproof. Um, where do you see the biggest mistakes that people make then when it comes to these trade-offs? I think, you know, we arrive at an intuitive 
understanding. I think whether people sort of are consciously thinking about their technology stack and their business model and like let me pick a software development process that optimizes for quality or that optimizes for UX, I think we just kind of naturally sort of form follows function in a very Uh Darwinian way. Like whatever experiences we have, we find our way to what optimizes for that. The trouble is, as software engineers, we tend to get really religious. <laughs> yeah. We think we, you know, we can have religious wars over like, you know, tab widths and text editors. And right. so, when we find a way to deliver software that really works for the product we're working on, we get dogmatic, and we think we found the one right way to do it. And um, and I think that that's fine as long as you're applying it to the same product. But you know, what if your company needs to pivot from web to mobile, like Facebook did? Or what if your, you know, what if your cons- free consumer game, your freemium consumer game, turns into an enterprise messaging app like Slack? Um, you may sort of pivot your way right out of what you are optimizing for. And if you have sort of religious or moral conviction that you are shipping software the right way, um, now you're going to end up with something that's really ill-suited yeah. <laughs> for what you're trying to do. Right. Where you're going to spend a lot of time and energy on things that are expensive and maybe you don't need to do. I think. Um, you know, I think of Microsoft doing Bing, which is free consumer web software, and I think they could have moved faster and taken more advantage of iteration, but it was hard to shake off the roots, the culture, the values of a software company that was making operating systems and needed really predictable schedules. And, you know, at the same time, I know from firsthand experience, it was really hard for Facebook to move from web to native apps, and that, you know, is not because Objective-C is a more difficult programming mm-hmm. language than PHP. Right. It's because of the culture that surrounded the way we released software. Mm-hmm. And that move fast and break things culture um, was dangerous <laughs> when you when Enjoying you took mobile. it to a native app, which yeah. you cannot update twice a day. Right. Which is, by the way, yeah. the rate at which Facebook updates it, its web app is twice a day. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, everybody's going to try to make these trade-offs, and, and I would encourage you to be self-conscious and reflective and do it and sort of write down what you think is important to you and what is easy to you and figure out if you're doing stuff that's expensive and not important and stop doing it because that's an opportunity for a big win. I'd encourage you to figure out if things are really important to you and you could optimize for them more. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is realize that your release process is not a matter of ethical or moral <laughs> right and wrong that it's just a pragmatic choice shaped by what works well for the product you're doing now Mm -hmm. and be prepared to pivot, be prepared to adapt when your technology stack changes, when your business model changes. So any final parting words for our viewers? Um, Well, I would say, you know, most of all, software is really a team effort. And so even if like you've watched this video and kind of absorbed the trade-offs and you're inspired to be adaptable or to apply the right process or the right values, um, you've got a whole team to think about, not Mm -hmm. just yourself. And so, you know, if you're bringing in leaders who are going to set the tone and, um, you know, and and set the kind of the engineering culture at your company, I think being really conscious that they either come from a background that emphasizes the same priorities Mm -hmm. as your company, or that if they come from a different background, they know how to adapt, that you're onboarding them really thoughtfully and that you're teaching people your engineering values so that um, so that you're all kind of optimizing for the same stuff and you know not making trade-offs that cancel each other out. Yeah, that's a good point. And so part of that is having those engineering values and sitting down and, and writing them out if you don't yet have those. Yeah, absolutely. Just get everybody rowing the same direction. All right, so just to recap, we've covered the topic today of how to make smart trade-offs when you're developing software products. And we talked about the trade-off space, and while that can be really big and filled with many, many different dimensions, you've got to narrow it down to ultimately what's a priority for you and your business. And so part of that is considering your technology stack, and it's really easy as technical folks to develop an intuition, but we've also got to think about the business model that we're operating under and factor that into the decisions we make. And then finally, we talked about the cost of a mistake and how we want to think about that in terms of the level of risk that we can absorb as a company. Finally, we have a challenge for you. We want to know when was the last time you had to make a decision when it came to trade-offs. What did you have to consider? What was the cost of the mistake? And what was your appetite for risk or your companies? 
let us know your response in the comments below. And the winner of the best response will get a special giveaway from Tracker and be hosted on the Femgineers weekly newsletter. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say and reading through their responses to get an understanding of the trade-offs and the decisions you've had to make when building products. So I'd like to thank our special guest again, Jocelyn Goldfein, for joining us today. Jocelyn, how can people get in touch with you or how can people, you know, learn more from you? Um, well, I keep, a, uh, I keep a blog, which you can find at jocelyngoldfein.com, or you can always follow me on Twitter at jgoldfein. And thanks to all of you for tuning in today. I'm really looking forward to your challenge responses. And of course, to our wonderful sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for helping to produce this episode. And if you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends, your teammates, and your boss. And subscribe to the YouTube channel to know when the next episode will be out. We'll have special guests, the founders of Product Hunt. Thanks. Femgineer's Confident Communicator course will be opening up soon. This course is only taught once a year, so you won't want to miss out. For more information and resources, visit femgineer.com slash confident dash communicator dash course. This pilot episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software faster. Can't make everything. For those of you out there who aren't familiar with Femgineer, Femgineer is an education company and our goal is to teach innovators how to build software products to make their careers more, uh, in, bleh, start again. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd love that first one, okay. Part of the problem is, bleh, okay, I'm gonna start all over again and I'm not gonna make a mistake next time. <laughs> we will get through this. You're making me feel a lot better. Right? Oh good! <laughs> all the camera And I'm like, actually it's gonna be fine. Awesome, okay. <laughs> I'm just gonna start these over. So. Thanks, and we hope you've enjoyed this episode. Oh, damn it. I thought I clicked, turned that off. Let me, uh, let me do it. Let me turn that off and do it again.